<laughs> Welcome to Wild Woman Network, a show for creative vagabonds, thinkers, and innovators. I'm your host, Sandra Lee Schubert, and welcome to the show. Well, good day, everybody. This this is I am indeed Sandra Lee Schubert, and I do want to let you know that the chat room is open, so please feel free to ask questions or leave comments there for my guest, um, having a conversation about all the weird tech in- issues that were coming up, and I was saying how it's mixed I guess feel so confident knowing everything may crash as we go. But I want to introduce my wonderful guest today, who is a Jungian analyst, a shamanic practitioner, and his name is Carl Greer, and he is the author of Change Your Story, Change Your Life, A Practical Guide to Transformation. So, Carl, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you here today with me. Thank you, Sandra. It's nice to uh, be on your show. <laughs> I know. I, I do threatening all sorts of technical crashes, you know, just before we start. But, you know, it's it's a live show and things happen. It, it's always kind of fun. So it's 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 a it's a great uh, it's a great way to sort of roll with life is being on a live show. I find. Yes. So. Yes, right. So you have this wonderful book, and I was just talking to you about it. I've been reading it. I've not had a chance to do the exercises. And why don't you tell us a little bit about your story, your backstory, and how you sort of got to this place of being the Jungian analyst and the shamanic practitioner, which according to the book kind of correlates kind of nicely. But tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh in the shamanic realm, they talk uh, about people having, um, in a lifetime, maybe seven or eight different lives. I don't know if how uh, empirical that is, but in my own case, I started out as a, a metallurgical engineer, and then I taught at Columbia University's Graduate School of Business. Then I became a businessman, and I had had uh, interest in uh, healing work and psychology, which Maybe 30-some years ago, I started to pursue, became a uh, clinical psychologist and a Jungian analyst, and then maybe 15 years ago, got very interested in uh, shamanism. And so my story has had those chapters in it, and uh, as I've listened to other people's stories over the years, I've seen uh, some of them where the person who's telling the story feels trapped and no longer able to author their own story. And so part of the group for whom this book is is people who feel trapped in their own story. That, that's very interesting. I mean, what, when you talk about being trapped in a, their, a person's story, what do you mean by that? I mean, is it the well, same let's story say you're a person over yeah, or, or there's a theme that's pervasive. Uh, let's say a pervasive theme is uh, a person who uh, is always there for others, always wanting to help others, but somehow their own needs get put to the side. That would be a story uh, a, 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 where a person can be trapped. They like it to be different, but they just haven't found a way to have that be the case. Or a story where somebody feels... Uh, for complex conscious and unconscious reasons, in order to really uh, do what they need to do in life, they have to work 80 hours a week and make as much money as they can to the exclusion of all else. That would be another story that someone would be trapped into. And there's many other themes like that, Sandra, that I've seen that people just can't get free of. All right, so... And I, I, I know I, I know for myself I understand a little bit about when you sort of are in the story of your life. It's hard to sort of see other possibilities because you think this is it. It's sort of like having, I guess for me it feels sometimes like feeling like blinders, like you think you can only go this way or only could go that way. And you, And it's hard, sometimes it feels hard to sort of break out of that that particular story you hold about yourself. Um, yes. I know, right, and I know for me, I, I have a writing course, and I talk about people's backstories. 
And I, one of the things I always ask people to do is sort of look at a story that's in the family. Like, say, if you have a story about, like, Uncle Joe, who's, you know, the town drunk. And that's like, oh, poor Uncle Joe. But if you look at that story from a different place and sort of realize that Uncle Joe was in the war and he saw death and he saw this, that story of Uncle Joe takes on a different kind of resonance. And, you know, he becomes more of a tragic hero than the poor drunk that sort of is hanging out in the, you know, the parking lot. So is that sort of some of what you're talking about when you're talking about looking at our stories or changing our stories? Yeah, just following up on what you said, uh, why do we feel that we get trapped and that we're kind of in a, a treadmill? It's for, I believe, the reasons you said, because of the other stories that have intermingled with ours, the stories of our parents and their parents, uh, the stories of the teachers who have given to us about how we should be, the stories of our culture, if you believe in reincarnation, the stories of our past lives. And as you start to understand those influences and then do what you just did with Uncle Joe's example, instead of having him be seen as the alcoholic in the family but the tragic you know, war hero, it's a whole different relationship to those energies. And part of the, the work of changing your story is to be able to work with those hidden energies so that they no longer have the same hold on you that they once did. Okay, and that's that's kind of interesting, and I think, you, you know, you have the Jungian and the shamanic, and my understanding, I'm just going to give you my real basic understanding, is so much of that there is so much symbolism and images and, and archetypes that are within those two two um, practices that I, I find yeah. very interesting. And so, so how did you sort of get to marry those two? I mean, were they sort of married all together, or did you sort of start one and then find shamanism as another road? How did that all come about? Um, they both uh, are ways to connect to the invisible worlds, and mm-hmm. uh, I find them uh, similar, but they have some differences in terms of emphasis and and techniques. And I found that both arrays of techniques and practices are helpful to uh, cause some of the transformation that I'm interested in. Okay. And and can you elaborate a little bit on that? I mean, what are the techniques that sort of... I mean, Jungian psychology. What what's involved um, in that? That sort of would fact would would influence somebody to sort of change their story or or, or work with their story in a different way. If, if I might uh, say something as kind of a precursor to the answer to the question, yes, yeah. uh, absolutely. A, a a first step uh, in changing your story is to really be honest with yourself as to what your story is. And uh, and that's harder than you think. I mean, as you were meditating on earlier, you know, to take the time to really step out of it for a while and reflect on it uh, just is, is hard. And then we often don't want to see our real story, but we want to tell ourselves the story that we'd like others to see about us. But if a person can start off and really say, all right, what is my story with its themes and all of its chapters about my health, my psychology, my relationship to others, my job, my relationship to a higher power, giving back in the world, and so forth. If you're really honest about that, then you can start to say to yourself, how would I like it to be different? And then you'd say, here's the new story. If I could, I'd like to have. And then when people get to that point, there's always this moment of uh, – question, well, if you'd like it to be different, why isn't it? Why haven't you chosen to live your new story? And then we have all kinds of reasons we tell ourselves, well, when the kids are out of the house, I will, or when I feel a little bit more better, when I'm making a little bit more money, or whatever it is. Uh, And even if you say, I can get past all those things, even though we may have an intent to change, sometimes we don't. And what's that about? Well, that's where the Jungian and the shamanic work comes in because I 
feel, and I've seen, that people often have inner resistances to change. They're unconscious resistances. The Jungian practices and the shamanic practices help you know what those resistances are and to work with them so that they no longer are impeding you. And to your question, what are the practices? Uh, in Jungian work, uh, working with one's dreams. Shamanic work, uh, working uh, with journeys, you know, journeys to the lower world, the upper world, the place before creation, working with the energy of death, uh, spending time in uh, intentional ways in nature, doing rituals and ceremony. So these would be the practices to access these unconscious places that may be causing you not to be able to live your new story because you're unconscious of them. Right. And and, and I think, um, I mean, I know if for me, you know, in my life I've had a, a transition where I went from living, I mean, I didn't move that far, but I always thought I would live in just one area for the rest of my life. I would just live and die in that one area. I <laughs> that that would happen. But it changed and I moved and I moved somewhere else and I'm in a different location. And I, I you know, this is a remarkable achievement that I could actually break out of whatever that story was that I'm going to live and die just in this one place and that's it. That's all I've got to be able to come into a new town, a different type of town with different experiences. And I know that, that just that change has actually helped me change a lot of how I am in the world. So I'm different than I was a year ago. How I interact with people is different. You know, what I'm doing is different. And, you know, it's just that, but it was really having to break past that thought that I could only do this one thing for the rest of my life. And, you know, just that process, and, and this is with therapy and people and writing and, dreaming that I could sort of transform a lot of that and let go of wanting to be back in that old place and being willing to step into this new place. So there is, there is, you know, it's not, you know, it's, there's work. I mean, there is work to change your story. Um, but the, the work can have benefits that we may not know before we decide, go into the story or go into changing the story. No, I, I, absolutely. Uh, I mean, a couple of things that uh, you said. You you, you had uh, experiences, uh, therapy, and other experiences. Uh, the end point of which uh, you made a uh, a change in your everyday life to go from one place to another. And mm -hmm. right. one of the things that I think is important when people do have spiritual experiences that somehow they're able to ground them in their everyday life. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's also part of the purpose, purpose of the book. But the other thing you said is just that change had reverberating changes in other aspects of your life. And I think that's so true. You change something about your, your health, it can affect your psychology uh, and your relationship to spirit. You change something about your relationship to a higher power, it can change your health and your psychology. You, you change something about your psychology, it can affect your health. So I, I think one change in one aspect of one story can have reverberating effects on others. Right. There's a, a phrase that um, uh, called, uh, you polish here and shine over there. Yeah. So you yeah. polish. Yes. Yeah, so it's it's always like so you you're working on something here, but it it has it has to shining something on the other the other side. And you know I do you know that really is fascinating. Like I have a friend who's also in the process of moving, and she's a little stressed by it. And I'm like, look, it's really going to be great. I can tell you from experience, it's gonna it's it's gonna work out, even though it seems hard and maybe it's a challenge and. You know, you're in a different place, and it's not exactly what you want. I said, but it's got so much other richness in it that you can't really even see at the moment because it just feels like stress and pain of moving and leaving and, you know, being forced out of someplace. But there is this opportunity within that change that can really impact your life in ways that you, might, you may not 
be able to see when you're you're on the other side of that. Yes, and and uh, it's been my experience that change is not always just a big miracle transformation, and your life has changed forever and ever afterwards. It's a process, and a person has to be patient with themselves. You do change yeah. at the margin, and eventually, all of a sudden, those little changes become quite big. But you, if you're hard on yourself and want you know instantaneous uh, results, sometimes you're really quite disappointed. <laughs> So this is true. I I am known to be sometimes a little impatient, and I I've gotten done a lot of change, but I'm sort of at the point where I'm like, okay, I want it to, I want everything to move faster, and that's you know it's a little it's a little challenge sometimes to sort of step back and say, you know, where is this going to go? Because I, I mean, from what I've read in the book, you know, you people to be really mindful of this change to really pull apart as you said pull apart your your story to see these themes and to see the you know how you got to where you are in a deep and powerful way i mean you know the, the exercises in your book are aren't aren't light for deep diving exercises that really can unpack what you what who you are in your life and really allow you to see something in a very deep way and not with shame or judgment but just be able to observe it as a an opportunity so it's not lightweight work that we're talking about and it's not like oh i'm going to sit down for a weekend i'm going to have my life transformed i mean so much of what you seem to talk about in the book is you know having these exercises but these pro the process goes on it's not as you say instantaneous you you sort of what this change might be in your life and steps to get there. So can you talk a little bit about how the process works in changing your story? Well, the um, uh, shamanic worldview, and I think this would be shared by uh, Jungians as well, is we have more things that are connected than we think. So everything in some mm-hmm. level is interconnected. And as we were saying earlier, if you... Uh, change one aspect of uh, your story, other aspects may change in ways that you're not even uh, aware of, like you shine here, you polish there, as you say, and vice versa, you're polished in a shine. So why and where, it just just does. So the process involves first saying, uh, I want to take a little time for myself and look at where I've been before I decide where I want to get to. And I have some exercises that help people uh, both uh, through journaling and uh, answering a, a bunch of rhetorical questions and uh, working with the uh, right side of their brain through some creative representations of their story. For example, you know, what's the song of your story? What's the poem of your story? What's the shape and color of your story? So that you're, you're kind of thinking outside the box about it uh, so that you have a real f- sense of what is and what has been for you as a stepping off place for what you'd like it to be. And then you're able to dream what you'd like your new story to be. And these practices, the shamanic work and the Jungian work, are ways to give you energy and information to shift from where you are now to where you'd like to get to. And they're all doable. You know, I've worked with enough people over time that they've all been able to do it. But you have to be patient with yourself, as you said earlier. You can't expect instantaneous changes. And uh, you do a little work and you see a little change and you integrate it and two steps forward, you may take a step back, but you're on the path of change. And once you get on it, I found it's very hard to get off of it, Sandra. <laughs> I actually have to agree with you. <laughs> I have to say it's true. I have a, um, uh, I created a mandala for my, for my, my new life, which I did a yep. couple of months ago. And, you yep. know, concentric, mine happens to be concentric circles, but I really... You know, for me, I'm very visual, and I have to sort of visualize things. And, you know, just the creating of that and finding the images that resonated and, and putting that up and just looking at that. It, it's been interesting to see how that that part of it is evolving as I go because it's got my desi- conditions and desires and, and just the cool aspect of looking at that and just saying, okay, you know, self-care is there. So how do I do that? You know, some part of that is, you know, practical doctor 
physical thing. Part of that is spiritual. Part of that is, you know, something else. And, you know, it, it requires just taking steps, but until you sort of place those things out into the world, you may, may not know what those steps are that you need to take to get there. And sometimes you have those steps as you go along. Which, yeah, and by doing what you make, do, excuse hmm? me, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I, I was going to say, by doing that, you open yourself up to that inner uh, wisdom figure within you that's, that's guiding you, not so much from your ego consciousness, but somehow you're relating in a different way to the information that's available to you. You talk about using a mandala. Uh, there's a, a practice in Jungian work called Santre work or Sample work, and in, in sh- uh, sh- shamanic work, We'll, we'll sometimes do a sand painting out of nature, very similar to what you're describing. So you, you may circumscribe a circle uh, on the ground. You may put sticks around it or flowers. And in it, you use natural objects to depict what's going on in your life just as you put into your mandala themes of your life. And you go out and you visit it, and uh, you just kind of see what it tells you. And you visit it over a few days, and it's amazing the different insights people get, and how nature itself may change it. An animal may t- come in and, and shift something that represented a particular part of yourself, or the wind, or the rain. Uh, new things appear in it that then have significance to you. So once you start to really feel we're part of these larger pictures and work with it with respect, it's amazing the insights that a person can get. Right, and I I do think that's that it's it's it really is kind of interesting what I think what happens. I mean, I've been in the process of working on song lyrics, lyrics, but you know, I was giving it a try, and I I woke up the other morning, four in the morning, with song lyrics in my head. And it was a very physical dream, with song r- r- lyrics being written on my body, and then mm-hmm. I had the song lyrics in my head and there was just this, you know, you wake up and go, okay, what was that all about? But hey, that's really great and I like that and I'm writing down these song lyrics and they were really, it was very interesting to see that process and, and have that physical thing of something being written on my body. I said, well, that's very, to me that was an interesting sort of symbol of, of that happening. You know, it really felt very tactile and physical and it just to me it's very interesting so I you know I love that you know personally I love that kind of stuff and my dream life is very active but what do you do when you get sort of you know you know what does a person do in the pro- this process when they get those kinds of things that seem like a symbol and if you don't have you know a nice Jungian analyst or shamanic person around how do you work with that kind of imagery when it pops up uh I spent a lot of time in my book talking about that question, and uh, the answer is you have a relationship with what pops up in a conversation with it, and I call that a dialogue. And the way okay. you do that is, uh, let's just say you have a symbol that comes up uh, in a journey or, or in a dream, uh, and let's say it's an image of a, a, a porcupine or a, an apple, let's say a porcupine. Mm-hmm. You merge your consciousness with that image and become it. So that's one split off of your consciousness. And then you have maintained the Sandra or the Carl part of our consciousness that can ask that part of the question. You ask it, you know, why did you appear to me? What message do you have for me? Then you shift your consciousness and let that porcupine answer the question. And then the part of you, which is the conscious uh, part that asks the initial question responds to what the porcupine said. And you go back and forth, and it's amazing what information you can get as you start to uncover these inner figures that live within all of us that have more autonomy than we think. And you don't need a therapist or a book or anything to tell you. And that's so much more powerful than, in uh, other words, let's say the porcupine comes up and instead of going to a book and you look up what do porcupines mean, you're really asking what do porcupines mean in your life and your psyche at this particular moment and ask it, you know, what message do you have for me? What do you want from me? Ask it any questions 
and then say, what can I do for you? Part of the things that I talk about in the books, Andrew, is when we deal with these other realms to do it with respect and not always be taking, but also what can we do for you to honor to honor you and your your contribution to us? Mm-hmm. And then how would how would people do that? I mean, it was you just do it uh, when you say honest. Mm-hmm. You, you do it uh, uh, in your uh, imagination, or if you need a physical way mm-hmm. to do it, it's somewhat it's similar to the Gestalt practice of uh, empty chairs. You can get a stone and you blow the energy of the symbol, let's say the porcupine, into it. You put it on uh, on the floor opposite you. You ask it a question. Then you go over, you physically pick it up, take a breath, become the energy of the porcupine, and you answer the question. You put the stone down, you go back to where you were. Now you're back in the Sandra role, no longer the porcupine role, and you respond to what that porcupine said. And you have a dialogue, and all of a sudden you have established a relationship with this thing that wasn't there before that gives you information and energy that you can use if it's appropriate to make change in your story. And it's amazing how Psyche will give you the lyrics on your arm when you need them or the inspiration from the mandala if you're quiet enough to hear the messages. And that's the other thing I would say. We have to, if we're going to hear messages from Source and the invisible worlds, we need to be quiet enough to be able to hear them. Okay. So it's, it's, it's one sort of investigating I guess, you know, because I know a lot of times on Facebook, somebody says, I saw a butterfly. What does a butterfly mean? And 12 people go to different sites and they put up butterfly, but really the person just take a little time and, and say, well, what does it mean? Have a conversation with whatever they think that butterfly might mean to them at that moment. So it's not so much uh, asking asking others, but really trusting your inner self to figure out what that that might mean. mean. When I've done um, past life work with people, people always ask, is our past lives real? And for me, it doesn't matter or not. It's what what's the story that's being revealed when somebody in past life in, in, in a regression. So what what is being addressed or what is being told to them in this story, I think, is is really important as to whether a past feel it, it the, the psyche brings up something to you to really look at, and I think that's something of what you're saying is that really just looking at what the what your own inner world is is presenting to you for exploration and and how to your book sort of unpacks that sort of in this very nice way through lots of exercises and different techniques to to unpack that in a successful way. Yes, it, it really is relying on oneself and trusting one's own experiences instead of asking the expert, you know, what you should do and what does this particular thing mean. And... If you're not used to doing that, it's scary, but boy, ultimately it's very liberating if you can start to trust your own experiences. Right, right. It seems it it, it seems that that just by utilizing the technique, the ex, uh, ex, 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 I'm sorry, I can't even talk. You're tapping into an inner wisdom, but you're all strengthening part of your part of that wisdom to really keep tapping into further. So I may have just made that a more convoluted fit today, but um, part of what you're seeing, I, I think, from everything that I've read in the book is really, you know, not only are you asking people to change your story, by virtue of doing these techniques that you have in this book, it starts to change your story anyway even if you don't know what that, what you might want to change the story into yet. That's so very I true. That, that, I mean, that, the process, yes, mm-hmm. yes, that's true. Right. It, yeah, it makes it very it makes it interesting. You, so you could go into this book saying, well, I don't really know what I want to change, but if you just play, played with the exercises and worked with them, start unraveling what, what you might 
some hidden desire in there that you might not even known was there before. You know, I think that's kind of fascinating. Yeah, because if in your conscious mind you you know your your current story, you tell yourself here's the new one that you'd like to have. You're absolutely right. Doing these processes, you may find out that in truth, the new story you'd like to have is different than the one that you thought. Right. Right. Well, I mean, isn't that true? Because I mean, how many times do people, you know, go for like, you know, a particular dream that they always thought was the dream, but then they get to the dream and say, you know, where did that dream come from? Dream. I don't. You know, people go to become a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, whatever, and realize that yeah, what they really want to do is work with animals in the mountains. But yes. you know, they yes. it, they had to sort of go through that one story. So I, sometimes I think you just have to get that story out of the way sometimes. But me, hopefully, from reading this book, you, you sort of eliminate the having to get that story out of the way process to find your true story. Right. Or, or, or maybe when you're when you're doing the other thing, you can do it a little less long and, and move to your true story. <laughs> but uh, I, I agree with what you said. Sometimes we have to uh, – life gives us – various teachers, and, uh, and some of them are things you have to do for a while before you know that's not what you want to continue to do. Right. You have to be, sometimes you have to dive dive in and go, well, okay, ne- never never mind. I, that, that wasn't what I meant. So uh, I guess, you know, let me talk a little bit more about maybe the shamanic practices because some of the things, I mean, I, I, some of the things you, you say people can do or not do as they feel comfortable and I know some of the things that people are living in an apartment in New York, they may not be able to go out and, you know, do some of the exercises, and some people may not feel comfortable. But can you talk a little bit about what the shamanic practices are and how that helps people journey through changing their story? Um, you know, shamans basically uh, work with energy. They do healing work. They try to uh, work with the past and work with the future bring things back from the past, you know, predict the future. So that's shamanic work. Uh, I think anybody can do some of that. And the notion of both psychology or shamanic work or Jungian work is uh, all we have is our present moment to act, think, and feel. And can we be as free as possible from past influences that keep us from acting, thinking, and feeling in optimal ways for us, and can we hook into a future that's perhaps more desirable than the one that we're now hooked into, so that by hooking into it, it will too influence what we do in the present. So shamanic work, for example, can help you understand some of these past entanglements that are influencing you in the present. And we do journey work, one place we go to is the lower world. This would be uh, known as soul retrievals. And you get a sense of what are the wounds that live within you, maybe that they're unconscious, that are influencing uh, you today. What are the deals you've made with life that uh, are unconscious to you that uh, are influencing you today? For example, I'll be nice to other people so they'll be nice to me. Or I'll never take... Uh, a risk so I won't get hurt. You know, so you find out mm-hmm. through this shamanic work what it is. Beyond that, you you access some energetic resources that weren't necessarily uh, consciously available to you. You really have some powerful encounters, and you and you come back with more information, maybe some lessening of the the uh, uh, energetic entanglements from your wounds and your deals with life, and some energies that you can use for transformation that may be in the form of a power animal or some part of you that heretofore has been kept kept out or unavailable to you. So that's one way uh, shamans would work soul retrieval. But you can also journey to the upper world, uh, the place of your future, to try to hook into a future that's more pleasing to you in spirit than the one that you're on. Uh, and bring back that energy to your present. So when you do that, Sandra, you have energies that allow you to, in the present, think, act, and feel differently, which is basically all we can do is think, act, and feel differently in the present. That's the, so it's being able to sort of 
um, having the opportunity to embrace the past and the, the future, but having it become one with the present so that you can transform. It gives you knowledge and information to transform where you are at, at the moment. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Okay, that's new. So your past, your past lives within you differently. I mean, it's, it, I mean, the events were the same, but it lives within you a little differently, and you're right. thinking about your future a little differently. Right. So I mean, it's kind of like when I was talking about the backstory of Uncle Joe, the town drunk. You have an opportunity to look at your life. So maybe you thought I was, you know, weak or I was ineffectual, but they find out about who you were in, in, in regards to your past that may transform how you approach yourself now and maybe you have more compassion or you can think about who you were so that in the present you can move forward to a different future. So, you, you know, if you feel more compassion for yourself, maybe not as hard as yourself on yourself and you could sort of release some of the anxiety or anger or whatever that might be that might have held you back up until yes then. exactly mm -hmm. exactly Nothing. and um did i, I don't, did we talk about archetypal energy uh we did not hey why don't we talk a little bit about that we have about uh, nine minutes uh, left, so we can talk a little bit about that. And just be before we go, before the you know the phone goes off, we still record a little bit after 45 minutes, so not to worry. But I just want to – I was remiss. I didn't give your, your website up front, but it's carlgreer.com, and your name is spelled C-A-R-L-G-R-E-E-R. -E -E did I get that correct? Yes, I hope. you did. Thank you. Did. you. Thank you. So I just want to make sure before we get to the end of the show, we'll say it again, but just in case people were wondering where, you, where to find you, they can find you there at least for a starter. So let's talk a little bit about what, what you mean about archetypal energies. Um, there's this idea that um, we live in a manifest world where we see things, and we also live in a world where there are energies that uh, influence us. Uh, and this comes from both the uh, cosmological or quantum physics idea, but it's also very shamanic that uh, there was a place before the Big Bang. Uh, I call it the place before creation. In my book, I talk about it as the quiet. And from that place of infinite possibilities, we have this universe that we're in, a lot of things that we see, but a lot of energies that we don't see. Some of the energies we don't see could be, described as archetypes, and they are energies that influence how we act, think, and feel. And we can get in the grip of an archetype and then act, think, and feel in a particular kind of way. For example, And then we, in order to understand them, we may give a, a human name to them. For example, we may say uh, you are in the grip of the uh, uh, father archetype. And you really want to father everybody and uh, take care of them and perhaps even tell them what to do. Uh, or the Hephaestus archetype where you're working all the time, you're, you're not a real uh, uh, happy person, but you just feel that you have to work, work, work. Or the archetype of the general who's always commanding uh, uh, his troops. You know, the, the great Santini was, I think, a, a colonel, but, you know, he, he, he couldn't put it uh, down uh, what he had his family life. So you get in the grips of these energies that uh, uh, unconsciously can cause you to be uh, particular ways that you really have trouble getting out from under those grips. That, that's interesting. So part of what happens in this book is identifying these energies or... Yeah, work, identifying them, working with them, and if they're no longer serving you, have uh, have ways to interact with them so that their grip on you can lessen and you can become more open to be in contact with another energy that that serves you better. That, 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 uh, that, yeah, I love the great, the great Santini as a as a, an example because when you start to talk about that in the that movie popped in my head, and then I was like, "Oh, the great Santini." I was like, "Oh, yes." I, I mean that that was a, a great um, example of, of being so stuck in a particular archetype that I, I really found that fascinating um, as a choice for a movie. But 
So we have about five minutes left. Uh, we've sort of covered a lot of things within this, but in the last five minutes that we have with the audience, is there anything else that you'd like to tell them in terms of changing their life and changing their story, changing their life that you could give them in the next couple of minutes? <laughs> Um, for the next four minutes, guys. Right. <laughs> uh, well, there, as I said earlier, there, there, there were two reasons why uh, I wrote the book, but there was also a third. You know, the one was to help people who are stuck in their stories uh, get unstuck. Another reason was to help people who have powerful spiritual experiences be able to bring those experiences into their everyday life to make change. But the third reason was to have people think about this giving back to life and to society by being of service to others. And uh, so the book talks about that. There's a chapter about how you can use some of these ideas to make a difference in the story of society. And part of it is uh, doing our own individual work, but part of it is thinking uh, – uh, more about our interconnections with uh, the earth, with others, with institutions, and how in the time that we all have left in our lives can we make a difference uh, in this world. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a big, uh, you know, dramatic thing, or you're going to serve on a board or give a lot of money. It can just be available to others in different ways than you have in the past, just to be present to them differently, just to listen to them differently. And so I talk about that in the book and ways to think about that that people may uh, find useful and ways to perhaps give birth to uh, uh, ways that they might do that that they haven't thought of uh, before. So that's part of the uh, message of the book that I'd just like to, to mention. Okay. No, that, that that's very good. It's, it's um, You know, I, I do have to say – that there is a lot, lot in this book. So you know, it's you know changing your story. You know, it's a practical magic transformation. That's the title of the book. However, it it it's really goes very deep, and there there the exercises are wonderful. And I didn't haven't had a chance to go through them all and and get to it, but they, it is a it, there's a lot of richness in this book and there's a lot of uh, things to really play with and explore and study. So, you know, I definitely would recommend people just go out and go out and buy Carl's book because it's a lot of fun stuff and, and I, the symbology and, you know, just how you sort of marry all these elements from your life together to to have this book happen. It's, it's just wonderful. It's just, it's a really powerful statement to your life experience that you were able to put this into a great book. Um, we have about a minute left, so Carl, why don't you I, we, I sort of said the title, why don't you say the title again and, and tell people where they can find you. Uh, it's uh, Change Your Story, Change Your Life Using Shamanic and Jungian Tools to Achieve Personal Transformation. The publisher of the book is Findhorn Press. Uh, mm-hmm. You can buy the book uh, online, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, my website, as uh, Sandra mentioned, is uh, carlgreer.com. Uh, I'm uh, on Facebook, and I uh, have uh, blogs periodically uh, on my uh, website. And the book uh, is uh, is digestible, uh, and it's a book that... Uh, you don't have to read in one sitting, but you can chew on it and work on it a little bit, see how it fits through a little bit more, and it's amenable to that type of uh, interaction with it. Very good. Well, I, I, again, I, I, my guest has been Carl Greer. I'm very pleased to have had you on. We've hardly covered all the things that are in this book, but I hope we gave a taste to everybody that they're just going to run out and, and buy it. And I just want to thank you very much for for being on the show with us today. I'd certainly appreciate it. Thank you, Sandra. I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on Wild Woman Network, a show for creative vagabonds, thinkers, and innovators. 
The role of social media has become an important part of doing business. We are busy, so adding one more thing can seem overwhelming. Part of what I do is take some of that stress away from you. If you are a busy entrepreneur, consultant, or have a busy small business, contact me at sandraleeschubert at gmail.com. Don't be left out of the conversation.